All right. Thank you for those of you who can join us today. Um, we are going to, we are a team learnfully, and we're going to look at unlocking reading and writing through executive function. And um, if there's any questions, we can address them at the end. But if we miss, if for some reason you're looking at the pre-recorded session, you're welcome to send those to us as well. And we'd be happy to address those. All right, so let's go ahead and look at our agenda. So we'll start with a welcome. Um, we'll look at some statistics on nationwide learning loss um, that we have all, I'm sure that that part isn't going to be too surprising for any of us. What is executive functioning and how that affects the stages of reading and writing? And then finally, we're going to wrap up with avoiding some learning loss. Um, and back to the in, uh, introductions, my name is Taya Slingland. I'm the Director of Educational Services over here at Learnfully. And with me is Jennifer, and we'll have you introduce yourself. Yes, thank you, Taya. My name is Jennifer Onoyan, and I am the Educational Specialist, and my specialty will be looking at executive functioning with a social-emotional lens. Thank you. Okay, so... Um, let's go ahead and look at some of the reasons that are driving us right now to possibly look at external uh, interventions outside the school system. Uh, the COVID pandemic has affected virtually every aspect of our lives. Well, no surprising, it also has affected our children, including their families, the social and emotional, as we're finding um, higher instances of, of children with uh, high levels of anxiety. Um, and this is obviously affecting their school experiences and their learning opportunities. Um, a recent poll that was done, 33% uh, of fourth graders are now proficient in reading across the nation. 31% of eighth graders are proficient in reading, and yet 92% of parents believe that they're at or above grade level. And you might ask, why the discrepancy? Well, we're looking at benchmarks that are commiserate with possibly post or pre-pandemic, you know, where children should be at given ages, given our um, what we expect them to be and where they're presenting now. So that's going to show a discrepancy. Now, this is where executive function comes in and why we have Jennifer here today to assist us in understanding what executive function actually is. Um, interventions, so when you hire a tutor, you have interventions on skills, um, but we need to make sure we're incorporating executive function intervention because interventions targeting executive function have been demonstrated potential in helping children at risk for school failure. So the studies that have been done um, and is proven to be effective in, in getting kids to apply those interventions rather than just learn them. So I'm, this is the kid, I'm talking to that kid that was, you know, doing really well while in the center, goes back to the classroom and you're not seeing it. You're not seeing that application. And that's because um, of executive dysfunction. So Jennifer, I'll leave it to you. Yes, thank you, Taya. So very briefly before I go into the executive functioning part, I was in the classroom. So before transitioning in from in person to online, I would be in the classroom and there would be, I would notice a gap, a gap between like Taya was mentioning between the interventions where, for example, if a child was having trouble with reading, you would have to go back to phonics, right? So sounding it out, constant repetition with sight words. But I noticed that there was still just one little block missing. There was just something that wasn't really fully hitting it. And that was executive functioning. Sounds much fancier than what it is, but if plain and simple terms, it is just the way our brain does things. If there's anything to take from the webinar, it is executive functioning, just the way our brain do, does things. It supervises our frontal lobe. It allows us to know what skills to use and also knows when, where, and how to use it. So think of it as a traffic controller. It helps us follow directions, planning, the, planning ahead, staying focused, managing our time while doing 10, one thing at once, maybe 10 things at once. So think of it as 
all working together. And it's something that we already do automatically. It begins as early from birth and develops all the way until the age of 26. It is not a linear progress, which means they don't begin at birth and then they automatically, by the age of 26, they got it, right? I still struggle with my own executive functioning. If I don't see it, I will forget it. So it happens over the years. The thing with our brains is we've come to know that it is very flexible, but it needs three things. It needs experience, circumstance, and need. Through executive functioning intervention, each intervention provides the experience needed to developmentally assist the process of executive functioning throughout the years for children. We highlight the circumstances where executive functioning is used, and we help with the specific need of the child. So like we mentioned, executive functioning is the way our brain does things and they are skills, right? Skills are things that we can learn and we can continue practicing. Some skills are stronger than others. Here are all the executive functioning skills. Some may sound very familiar like planning, time management and working memory. The ones that we will you'll actually hear us say a lot is metacognition, task initiation. Think of task initiation as the ability to get things started. When a child is having a hard time with task initiation, they procrastinate, right? The biggest thing with these skills is even though they are separate in skills, they are not isolated. They work together. I like to say that they have best friends. You can't have time management without its best friend task initiation, right? Planning, you'll always see planning and organizing a lot together. They're best friends. So you're almost pulling from one skill to help with another. Think of it as a Jenga tower. So with a Jenga tower, if you pull a couple of blocks, it can still stand, right? But it's still very wobbly. That's the way a child who struggles with executive functioning learns. They can they can still learn, right? They can still read and write and they can be very, very brilliant, but their learning throughout is very, very wobbly and they found ways to cope with that. A lot of it looks like a lack of motivation. You might even see some behaviors happen like procrastination. They'll do everything but the task at hand. So with executive functioning intervention, we're kind of just putting back those blocks so they can have a more solid structure for their learning. I'll give you an example of one task and how different the reactions are. You might see your student or your own child have the similar reaction. So with the task of just writing, you have multiple scenarios and I'll go through each of one of them. You might see the child with the one that says, do I have to? This is the one that's really struggling, really dragging their feet to get started. They're, maybe they finished, it's probably one problem, but it took them a whole hour to do. This is the child that really is struggling with task initiation. They have a very hard time just getting started. And like I mentioned, if they take, if it takes them one hour to do one problem, you're also kind of mixing in time management in there. But biggest one we would tackle would be task initiation. The other scenario is the child where you have to consistently tell them like, okay, let's go, let's get started. They'll give you the, the feedback of, okay, no resistance. But then if you come back to check on them 10 minutes later, they're reading a book or they're doing something because they got distracted, right? They, they're they telling you, okay, I'm going to start. But this is a child who's having a really hard time with flexible thinking. More specifically, they're the ones that have a hard time with the transition where it's Especially if it's a preferred game, like if you've ever tried to transition a student from a video game or your child from a video game to doing homework, it is pretty painful. So that the child is really struggling with flexible thinking in terms of transition. Then you have the child who doesn't even remember that they have homework, where it's probably March and throughout the whole entire year, they've had homework every single day and they're still saying, oh, I have homework, they're still forgetting. They forget to turn it in. They forget to, if they complete it, they forget to turn it in, right? That child really is struggling with work and memory. That's when you see a lot with writing, a lot of frustration. A lot of frustration if you do get them started, maybe halfway they just quit and they have a big meltdown. That child is really struggling with self-control and we'll talk not necessarily self-control where they can't control themselves with the emotion. It's more regulating when things get really hard especially with writing. The last two 
This one is the child who says, teacher never taught me this. Maybe it's a lesson they just learned. They just learned it. They got the homework. But once they get home, they're just like, I never learned it, right? We would tackle a lot of self-awareness, which falls under metacognition, right? It just helps them move that information from school to home, right? Where it, we would literally help them remember, yes, you did learn this. What are some ways you can bring that information from school back to home? The last one, like you see from the picture, teacher says it's not due until next week. You see their calendar burning on fire. You see their all their assignments stacking up on the side and they're on their phone. This is the child who has a hard time with time management. They have maybe 10 projects they have to do throughout the week, but they just don't know how to prioritize it or see how long one task takes. That would be time management. In this example, we've seen that one assignment can cause different reactions. For intervention, I'll take the example of the child who has a hard time with task initiation, right? So this is a skill that that get up and go skill, that get up and I'm gonna start this right away. What intervention would look like is we give them, again, we provide the circumstance and we give them the need, which is the tool. So right here is the Let's Begin board, which is a tool, great tool for helping students get started on something. You can see there's a variety of different options from anywhere from like a movement to a fun game, like a riddle of the day. This way you're giving them back their agency and allowing them to start one task while also meeting it all the way up to the completion of that task. We mixed, in this board, we mixed a lot of variety. So you have the physical, do 10 jumping jacks, and then we also brought in the non-preferred, which is the homework, right? So we start with very, very simple basics. Take out the homework of the day. You give them those little wins to start building up to ultimately the middle part of the board. Let's do the hardest sheet together. If they're younger, and really struggling with the duration of it, if you can even use it as if you do three in a row, we take a break. So this is a way where we provide, give them examples of a strategy or a tool and help them really start building their own independence. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about how all of what she said affects specifically into reading. So we're gonna break this down a little bit. Um, these are some of the things I'm going to ask you is, are, is your child forgetting what they've read? Do they not enjoy reading, but they enjoy the stories? So listening to it, they like, it's not that they don't want to, they don't want to be part of a book. It means that the process of decoding and comprehending and all of that is weighing on them and they're to the point where they're not enjoying the story. Does their reading sound labored? Are they really eff the effort tripping over each word? Are they reading too fast only to not understand? Getting to the bottom of the page, it's just it's like the decoding is off the charts, but there's nothing. Um, were they early readers only to follow behind? You know, a lot of um, fall into that trap. If my child started reading at four, how, what do you mean they're having trouble re in third grade? Well, little fun fact is that early reading is not a precursor for how well they're going to perform later in life. There's a great leveler that occurs. So, it, I'm, and I'm not advocating don't introduce literature. I mean, I, I read to my kids in the womb, um, but as far as it, we always need to be cognizant of them at each stage. It can creep up us on us. They can be early decoders which means they can read the words, but they're not understanding what they read, or they can read and understand simple text. But when we get into those layers of complex themes, they have struggle. So, and then the last one is, do they sound out the same word over and over again? Um, if you are looking at, you tell them a word and then they see it three steps later or three words later and they're sounding out again, they're they're not memory they're not remembering that or another thing is is if um there's a word you know they know and they get it wrong and you point to it and they get it right that's not a skill error that's an executive function error so it's important for us to to think of okay what is skill error what is executive function error? and the reason that we need to make sure we're cognizant of both and how they interact together 
is that when we apply intervention, if we're applying, you know, keep dressing it like a skill, it's never going to apply. So that's why it's important for us to be looking at that. So we're going to look at the developmental stages of reading from phonics to novels. And our early stages, that K1, we're that magic stage where they all want books, where books are magical, they have big, beautiful pictures. Uh, in my classroom, I taught K1 a lot of my career. Um, it is just magic time. I loved opening boxes of books with them. And um, this is the learning to read stage. So um, is your early reader, like I said, mispronouncing those words over and over and over? Are they skipping punctuation, which means they're reading it until they just kind of run out of breath? Um, are they reading without expression, which is no highs and lows, it's just monotone? Um, are they misreading small words like the and of, only to get big words like dinosaur? Um, the reason they're doing that is because the dinosaur, the bigger word, is easier for them to, um, to construct, to be able to, to identify. Um, are they guessing words by the first sound? Or are they reading, like I said before, too fast? Well, this may be um, an EF skill called self-regulation. And self-regulation, what it looks like is when they're when they're younger, there's there's kind of two components. There's the one we think of, the impulse control. That's the constant movement. Um, their ability to manage their behaviors and action is inhibited in some way. So they just breeze through it without goal in mind. Um, or there's the more quiet ones. That is the internal control system. And that is their ability to drown, to kind of keep themselves from being distracted. So that is the controlling the irrelevant -re thoughts like, ooh, friend just walked in, or ooh, something's going on outside when they're, they're doing a task. Um, so it, you can imagine when a child's having trouble sitting still, and they're they're asked tasked to do this something that's brand new and it's very complex. So it's like you can either sit still or you can do the task. Um, you know, usually you can't get the kid to do both without building that stamina first. So what to do? We need to build awareness. So awareness is basically you don't want to become their executive function by going, I need you to do this, I need you to do this, I need you to do this. You want to guide them toward what is happening. Um, if they get to the end of the page, they read really fast. Hmm. You ask them some questions. Why do you think you don't remember what you read? Oh, because I read a little fast. What should we do? Maybe I should read a little slower. How do you know that you're reading slower? Maybe I could point, put my finger on the ending uh, punctuation, which is something we, we teach when they're little. Um, so there's these different strategies that you kind of, but you're not telling him what or her what strategy to use. You're guiding them through the strategy. So that discussion and reflection, they're building that repertoire. They're war trust on how to build their their stamina with it. Great games for them to play is red light, green light, Simon says, board games, taking turns, anything that builds that inhibition you know, lowers that, uh, that, that impulsivity and in, in, in builds that, that ability to kind of temper themselves that will, that will build the stamina. So the next thing is that we're going to look at that is reading to learn. So when we go from K1, we go into second grade, second grade is kind of the, we practice all those skills. And then you go to the third grade and you fall off the cliff. That cliff is like, okay, but we were holding steady with these. Now we're expected you have to know because now we're in application stage. You need to know how to read because now you're using that skill to learn. You're not learning how to ride a bike. You're riding your bike to the grocery store for that next stage. Um, is your child at this stage, this third grade, fourth grade stage, hyper-focused on sounding at words, having difficulty when rules change, lack an understanding of what is read, or consider different words have different meanings. For instance, you know, a word can change depending on the context, wind and wind. Sometimes you won't know unless you're reading the sentence. 
which what is spelled the same. Um, shifting perspective of learning new information. You know, sometimes, especially as they, they start getting older, you're looking at, you know, two characters and they're looking at the same scene, but how they look at it can change that perspective. Um, understanding, this is a big one, that transition cliff is that our system of language, English, changes a lot. <laughs> you learn all the rules and then we're going to change it. That CH can say chase or can say Christmas. So that is cognitive flexibility, a different executive function skill. And that is the ability to see from multiple perspectives. Things that you can do to build that out is card games like Uno, set with friends, riddles, um, looking at pictures that change perspective, you know, the faces, the base, um, games with building patterns. So you can see how it ad adapts. You need to basically teach them how to adapt to changing environments. So the next thing is, is we're moving toward four to five. You can see that it's building stamina for longer text. So now you're not just reading to learn, you are building that stamina. Critical thinking is put in. So it's not just abstract, it's critical. You're looking at two different texts and seeing how they're related. Um, you're analyzing multiple sources. You're providing textual evidence. What textual evidence means is that, okay, here's my answer, but where did you find it in the story? Now, if it's not explicitly said, but it's interpreted, you still have to be able to go and find it. Based on this, I can interpret this to mean this. And they're starting in fourth, fifth grade, they're, this is a building skill that they're gonna have to do where they have to write about their position and they have to be able to provide evidence to support it. Um, so where kids fall off with this is they're still struggling with rote memorization. They're doing, they struggle with doing multiple things at once. They get lost even with multiple step directions. I've had parents say, my child is brilliant, but they're a serial learner. I have to give them one thing, they gotta do it to completion, and then I gotta give them another thing, and they gotta do it to completion. Um, they struggle organizing and prioritizing. That means is, okay, they have their friends, they're gonna see that afternoon, but they got this homework thing in the morning. So they're thinking, you know, I can finish that in 10 minutes because I got this going on, or, you know, I'm just going to wait till after this, that prioritizing, or if you have a long-term project, what do I do first? How do I know which goes first? Because long-term projects, some, some things are predicated on the others. Um, they frustrate easily, or in class, they zone out. Um, or sometimes teachers will say, you know, I just don't think your child's listening to a thing I say. What this might be is working memory. Working memory is the ability to not only retain information, but to keep things in your head while you're manipulating them and applying it. So basically you have to keep a goal in mind. You have math facts. Now you're learning multi-step division. See how I'm applying that, there's steps involved. My goal is to finish these steps, but now I gotta remember my math facts, but I have trouble with rote memorization. This is the application stage that starts building and why intervention is important in not just the skill itself, but the reason why they didn't acquire the skill in the first place. Um, so working memory allows us to persist through challenges. It allows us to follow directions and multiple steps to maintain focus. Sometimes you look at the uh, child and you're like, you know what, they're not, they're not attending. Clearly they have an intentional issue, but then they come back and it's like, there's no attentional issue. Working memory is like our computer. We can put a bunch of different things into it, but if we do too much, it, it gives us that little wheel because it has to process all those commands. We are doing that to our children. We are, our society today, more than ever, is a very fast paced society. And these kids are getting loaded up. And basically they just need a minute to process what it is we're telling us, telling them. So um, 
it's one of those things that you can do things to build, like everything else, build stamina, make connections to new things, practice words. You get, you have a new word. Oh, what does that make you think of? You know, play with words. Don't just memorize. Here's a stack of vocabulary cards. Have them tie it to something they know or have them draw a picture of what that means to them. It's tying it in a different way. Um, you know, visualizing and drawing and games like chess and uh, creating associations will build on this. Um, also, I always say with working memory, playing you know, the game memory, <laughs> matching those up, um, all these things will assist you with building some of that stamina. So in that kind of goes through six through eight and high school. So you'll notice as we, that four through five is a transition and everything is, is, is encapsulated and it just builds in intensity. So, you know, that citing of evidence, ex, that ex, um, textual evidence, you'll see it's in six or eight, it's in high school, that comparing literature to a, to a new literature, that's all the way through college. Um, so you just, it's practicing and building that stamina that's gonna help them. So very similar and Say you actually have my mind going with what you were saying about reading. Very similar to the stages of reading, we have writing, right? And a lot of what Taya mentioned does overlap into the writing. So a lot of the skills that are good for reading will actually also be really good for writing. So I will actually put a couple of the stages up at a time because across the board, I've seen pretty much some of the same, they're very common issues. A lot of the common issues I find from as early as third grade, you'll start to see once they start writing, going into stories, which is around grades two to three, you'll notice a lack of structure. They really like to write. They write a lot. But the sentences don't follow a sense of thought or they don't make sense from one to the other. It's just kind of like all over the place. You start, they start missing basic grammar rules according to each grade level, but either because they're rushing through it and they just want to get it done. Around four, I would say middle school around the most, you'll start to see if they're really struggling in the writing stage, basic sentences with minimal descriptive language. So if they have to describe a character, you'll see maybe a sixth grader still use words like this character was bad, where, okay, that was good for second grade, but if they're really struggling with the writing, you'll see just the basic done, barely enough to just answer the question instead of really diving deep into what the question is asking. And that's a lot of what writing really tackles, right? So one of the biggest things across the board, and I've seen it as early as third grade to as early as second grade actually is the resistance to writing. That resistance, if it builds to middle school or high school, it will be like pulling teeth to get them to write just one. Again, that if it takes them a whole hour just to do three sentences, they are really fighting that writing, that big resistance. And that is executive functioning territory. You'll see it show up in a bunch of different ways. If they're just trying to get through it just to get it done, that's attention. If they're moving through it, but in such an anxious and tedious way, you're getting into self-regulation. So I put all of the stages up there because very similar to the reading where it's phonics to novels, we are doing letters to essays. So I put all of them up there because you can start as early as kindergarten where with the same skills, depending on what age they're at. So main goal, if they're really fighting, if they're really fighting even just to write or feeling that resistance for writing, main goal no matter what grade is just make writing fun again yeah start early. change start as early as possible change the basic behavior that way instead of once they hear writing instead of hearing oh i immediately shutting down you want to just start making it fun again so you're changing the immediate response to something that's a little bit calmer while doing the activity again
again, like Tana mentioned earlier, it's behavior modification. Same thing where it's like, if somebody wants to go work out, the best way to do it is to start getting, working out makes you go, uh, to start by making it feel a lot better. Again, make it in a way where you're going into it in a calm manner and open to any frustrations that you might see. Like I mentioned, start as early as possible. Different ways to make it fun. Get back to pen and paper. Have them scribble free writing prompts, fun, wacky stories at any age, through any grade level and any stage. Kids, you really want to get back that creativity and that fun back again. Get it back to pen and paper where you're not only are you involving their cognitive skills, but you're going back to the physical aspect. Because I know a lot of it come middle school, they get in a lot into the typing. Go back to the basics. Good old pen and paper. Mad libs. Giving them a picture. Yes. I find yes. giving them a picture really, it doesn't, I, I've done it with ninth, 10th grade, sometimes giving that visual thing and tell me what this picture tells you. And they'll start yes. a little bit hesitant because they want the, the parameters and then then they'll get flowing and then the characterization will come in and then yes. they want to be able to refine that story. And now you have them. Yes, especially, mm -hmm. it, no, that's a really good point. Especially if they're really good with verbal storytelling. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times it doesn't translate verbally on paper as much, but if you really util utilize the strength, again, I put all the stages up there because it's, this it can happen at any age they're really good at the storytelling, get them to tell the story first. Now you're getting them excited. You're changing the behavior from that resistance to something they're more willing and open for. Mm -hmm. Wacky stories at any age, people love wacky stories. Like I mentioned, get a change the medium. So if they're struggling with reading, more than likely they'll struggle with the writing. So change the medium, show them a picture, ask a question about it, ask, have them write captions to a scene or have them do comic book writing. Change the medium from pictures to videos where you show them a video, they get to answer a short question from that. That way, again, you're engaging them in a completely different way other than the one that they've been so used to. And that way you're slowly changing the resistance of, okay, you're gonna write. You're changing the uh, response to like, okay, now they're a little bit more open to it. Again, I will repeat, getting back to the basics any stage so middle school and high school is when they start doing a lot of persuasive writing a lot of narrative comparing contrasting going back and reviewing the outlines of each of those writing forms really gives the student a clear goal and a clear direction of how their writing is supposed to go yep. allow them to experiment with each medium again fun free writing with no expectations of spelling or punctuation you might even want to encourage like misspell a word, just get them to start writing in a much fun way. During this time, biggest thing too is emphasize the strengths, emphasize their strengths, especially if they've struggled for a while. Now they've kind of developed the identity and belief of I'm just not a good writer. I just can't write. I just don't like it. So really emphasize the strengths that you're a really good storyteller, for example, I know you just need maybe some tools to help get your really good stories onto paper. So those are just a few, again, they overlap a lot of what Taya was mentioning for the reading, but then just a few, just make writing fun again. I love it. Okay, so to, I know that we have a lot of um, teachers and educators here along with our parents. So I did want uh, to let you know that we do provide um, professional development for teachers and for schools if that's something that you feel your school might need. Um, we partner with some with some schools across the country with, for this. So uh, if that's something you might be interested, um, just directly reach out to Stephen at Learn Place. So, um, but we are mostly here for parents. Um, if you weren't, I know we ran over a little bit today, so we didn't really get into the questions, but if you have a question, um, please feel free to reach out to contact at Learnfully. One of us will get back to you um, with some answers. We do, we do want to encourage you to, we want our community to be interactive. Um, so you could scan that QR code if you're looking for services for your child. Um, we are doing $100 off um, 
a spark assessment. I know that um, some people had asked uh, us prior to us starting about, you know, how do I know my child has executive function issues and isn't just being a kid? Um, and I, I encourage you to one of the things we do is we do assess whether or not we're looking at possible executive function issues. But um, I do encourage you to think of two things. One is if you see a consistency in what you're being told by educators, that means your child's standing out as far as the norm of the room. So that consistency might be making you question. Uh, another thing is, is your child's behavior or their, their a way that they're addressing different, some of these different situations that we have discussed today um, is inhibiting their ability to function either with their friends or at school or at home. If it's inhibiting their ability to function, we might need to look at something a little bit deeper. So um, that's what we're here for. We're here to help. Uh, but just so you know, uh, we are Team Learnfully, and thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you again at one of our next webinars. Thank you. Okay.